So this is a switch from being a, a fraction, being uh, less than a third, to being two thirds. And that is a pretty dramatic shift. You'll have a middle class in China of a billion people. Billion people by 2050. Middle class. So these are not trivial changes in the outlook. These are tectonic shifts in terms of the way the planet works. And as I said to you, as I look at all of you, in my generation, we didn't have to think about that. In the Dean's generation, it was 80-20, or 78-22, or something like that. It was, it, was, it was a balance where you knew you were the rich countries, the powerful countries, and all the organs of running the world were designed to accommodate that fact. But the world that you're going into is a very, very different one. And it's not something that is going to be turned back. It's something that will happen. It may not happen linearly. There may be events that will occur that will disrupt it for three years or five years. And it may not be exactly 65-35. Uh, it may be a variation of that, but directionally, it is very clear. And there are a couple of observations that I think are interesting beyond that. Uh, but before I get to the observations, let me make one other point about the planet. And that is that there, and I say this in, in the presence of the Dean, because in Africa, of the eight or nine hundred million people that are now there, that will grow to two billion people by 2050. Two billion out of nine billion. And the estimates are that the average per capita income for people in Africa at that stage will be between two and three thousand dollars per capita. The same projections would have China and India are at between thirty and forty thousand dollars per capita. So you got two to three thousand, thirty to forty thousand. And countries in the so called rich world, United States, European countries, somewhere between ninety and a hundred thousand dollars per capita. I'm not giving you these figures with any sense of mathematical accuracy, they may be off a bit. But directionally they're right. So if you have two billion people living in a continent with two to three thousand dollars per capita, you have China and India uh, with more people, three to four billion, uh, three billion, uh, between thirty and forty thousand dollars per capita, and you have the rest of the world somewhere uh, either north of that or in a middle class somewhere between the two countries, uh, the two uh, uh, areas of the world, you have a basis for instability. Africa is not a continent which is any longer isolated. It's not a place where people are uninformed. It's the fastest growing market for cellular phones. Information, as you, as you would well know, whether it's in the townships or wherever it is, is now passes very quickly. And that's not just in South Africa, that's in the 53 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is not an issue which is going to go away, nor is it an issue which is trivial to those of us that live as we do here. This is a major issue which is not being confronted and which you will have to confront at some stage. And that gets into a second issue which I would like to touch on, which is what is happening with the rest of the world as it looks at this changing dynamic. Having worked in the World Bank and had some familiarity with the whole issue of aid, I know just how tough it is to get people in the rich world to really understand what the responsibilities are not just as a matter of conscience, but as a matter of enlightened self-interest to try and help development in the developing world. There was established decades ago a 0.7 target 
for foreign aid. My colleague from the former colleague from this activity who is here from a different part of Stanford, as I understand, uh, uh, knows this. And we're now really, after a lot of speeches and a lot of activity, we're starting to get some momentum before the economic crisis of 15 months ago, which we're now maybe getting out of to a degree. But it's now not at 0.7, it's about 0.2 that we have reached. And there are a lot of statements that are still being made, but in terms of the actual money which is flowing, if you X out the amount of money that are going to the trouble spots in the world today, there is very, very little development. And in fact, the per capita contributions to Africa have been declining steadily for the last 10 or 15 years. So one of the tragedies is that there's great analysis of the issues. There's great understanding of the issues. But these, like the environment, are long-term issues. And political decision-making is essentially short-term. And so you have political decisions which are being taken in terms of this demonstrable development in terms of global balance that certainly, so far as Western countries are concerned, is not being met. What is interesting is to see how the dynamic between Africa and China and Africa and India is developing. Three years ago, for the first time, the summit meetings of the African leaders was held in Beijing. And they swore after that that it was unlikely that they would ever meet again in a Western country. Simultaneously, 400 African businessmen met in New Delhi. And each led to a understanding on the part of both the Chinese and the Indians of having a dimension of their activities geared towards Africa. Of course, there's been an Indian community in Africa, particularly in East Africa, for a long time, and there are now 750,000 Chinese in Africa. And if you're in the business that I'm in, I was recently in an African country where we were involved in a, a, in a real estate development. We went up country to visit this real estate development, and, um, uh, which was near a university. And I was astonished to find that everybody on the team that was doing the development was Chinese. The uh, architects, the town planners, the builders, everyone was Chinese. So if you go to Africa today, you don't see people who come from Western business schools. You see people from China and from India. And I just raise that as a point. And the second point I would make is that in terms of China and India, in terms of their development, uh, I was trying to get the most recent numbers, and they may be in my, my, my uh, Blackberry, but I haven't looked. But the numbers in uh, 2007 were the following. There were 110,000 Chinese studying in the United States. There are now over 100,000 Indians studying in the United States. So I look around the room, I suppose it's not surprising. There were 11,200 Americans studying in China and 2,800 studying in India. This is madness. It's just madness. And it's a tragedy in terms of the potential for our young people that are still being guided to look towards Europe, to look towards graduate work in British or European universities, when the world is telling them that the dimensions have changed notably. I was very interested to hear that there's been a recent trip made by some of your students to Asia and another one to the Middle East. But what is needed in today's world is for us to come up with what is the last thing that I'll touch on, which is this historically 
the Western countries were able to stay ahead, firstly uh, because of manufacturing. Well, that got taken out and manufacturing moved to Asia. The second thing that happened after that was that in service industries, uh, it moved to the Western countries. And now that's been taken out in terms of Asian really dominance in the service areas. And thirdly was in technology, we were able to stay ahead. But as is evident to you, and I'm sure from your colleagues and people you know, the technological advance is now shifted as well. So the challenge for our country is, <laughs> what the hell is it that's going to be left for us if Asia's eating our lunch and dinner in terms of the things that we used to be able to do? And it's not just the United States. It is truly that group of the so-called billion plus that were previously the dominant factor who had 80% of the world's GDP. And so I leave you with that issue because as, as people that are going out into the world, if it were me today, the number one thing that I would be thinking about, which is different from when I grew up, is that the 80-20 rule which I had comfortably in my hip pocket is going to be a 35-65 rule. And that puts a challenge of dramatic proportions to anybody who's at a business school today or graduating. And so I was told that I should go for about this time, and I would then be peppered with questions that would be so intelligent that I wouldn't be able to answer them. So, <laughs> so, 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 so if there are questions, I'd be delighted to have a shot at them.